Well, good afternoon. Gunther, I heard your presentation fantastic, and uh, I think you've got incredible opportunity to bring all the technologies and the vision in one of the vibrant economies of India. You've got some challenges I appreciate, but we're with you because we are very heavily involved ourselves in India and China and the rest of the world. With that said, I think my topic is fascinating. Is there? Yeah. Topic is fascinating. The smart mobility is that a reality? Well, I mean, hands on CEO, and that's what we all do. We make things happen. Uh, even if something looks far fetched, the reality is that uh, no industrial revolution happened overnight. It took a lot of effort, it took a lot of collaboration, cross border, cross country, cross companies. So that's where exactly we are. We are in an industrial revolution 4.0, which is already in the works. A lot of these evolution, if you look back in the historically, but they were not dormant. There was stuff happening, but close to the ground for quite some time. All of a sudden, start to take off, and then it's exponential. And I'm not so sure whether we are right close to exponential shape of the curve yet, but it's, I can share with you, it's getting very exciting, especially where I sit at the intersection of many, many technologies and dealing with some of the incredible partners, be it Google or, or uh, Baidu or what have you, besides mentioning all the customers we learn every day, whether it's the Daimlers or the BMWs or, or uh, Chinese or Japanese or American customers. But it's a reality, it's something I would like to share with you how I view where we are headed. Uh, it may not happen in one year, but it's a journey. So it's an interesting reminder to me, to all of us, oil was not valuable until it was black oil. Nobody figured out what to do with it. Once we did something with it, we refined it, it became powerful, it became gold. Same thing applies to data. Data is not new. Data term has been around for decades. Like artificial intelligence term has been around for decades. IoT has been around for decades. All right, but we have not fully benefited from these. Data is only good once you create information out of it and do something with it, which I think we're in the midst of it. We are already doing it, but on a scheme of one to 10, we are still in second inning. In cricket terminology, we have just started, the first opening pair has started batting. In the baseball, we're in inning one or two, perhaps. So that's where we are. If you look at this picture, this picture is actually a visionary picture. But we have to have a vision, all of us in this room or outside. Until we know where we want to get there, want to get, you will not get there. So where we have been busy, my company, Harman, a, a leader in connected infotainment technology, I focus on a car for a second. On a given car, we put in 30, 40, 50 million lines of code. We do smart computing, basically a nerve center. We're dealing with all subsystems on multiple ECUs in the car many, many sensors and algorithms we interface with, including level zero, level one, safety-related ADAS feature functionalities. But that's not the end of the journey. We are pursuing a seamless connectivity where we as a human, we like to see what we are so used to, whether you are Android or iOS phone user, that's the environment, the experience, the mobility, the digital experience you want to take with you at home, on the go, in the car, or in the venue you're visiting in the evening, or cinema, or what have you, you still want to have your, your complete digital experience with you. So that connected experience is not here yet. We still have a lot of disparate systems. There are attempts being made, but they're still work in progress. That's all I'll say. And to get there, I'll also remind now, and I'll remind many times, what we are into, no one company, whether you are Google, Intel, Samsung, or Baidu, alone, no one company can achieve this. This will require collaboration, inclusivity, and government smart policy. I had an opportunity to spend some time with the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, this morning, and he asked me, what do you need as an industry? I said, we need smart policies. I use the word smart, smart policies. Without 
government-to-government -government interaction and policy definition and cooperation. We're not going to have smart cities. We're not going to have a smart connectivity. We're not going to have V2X or V2I, the interaction. And what's on us is massive zillions of data points and the scary thought of cyber. We all know what cyber, uh, cyber defense and cyber attacks can be. As soon as you connect a car, you've got a lot of uninvited guests trying to get in your car. That's where you need collaboration, you need standardization, you need smart policy. Samsung's acquisition of Harman was one of that attempt. Everybody knows Samsung is a, a large, very innovative company uh, spending about $15 billion in R&D and about $45 billion in capital expenditure. Big R&D, and they've committed to spend about $180 billion in R&D in the next three years. From chip, from memory, to mobile data centers, the largest smartphones network in the world, the smart devices, smart appliances, AI, you had a lot. But they got into, through harm and the competence, the system integration, system know-how, knowledge, how do we work in automotive? We have an opportunity. But again, I'm not saying only Samsung Harman can do it, but this will require scale, this will require innovation, and tremendous balance sheet, I repeat, balance sheet. We have lots of startup companies here. They want to be part of the large infrastructure. They want to be part of the large scheme where we, they can make something big happen. Now, this is an interesting picture for any one of us. Basically, it's an ultimate desire to have what I just described. All those circles here, it's an eye test, don't worry about it, but basically each of those circles is defining what the life we live in. The living room life, the office life, the car life, sitting in a uh, Kennedy Center experience or watching a live uh, soccer game. That's the life. Imagine all of that could be brought in the car seamlessly, safely delivered to you without any buffering. I hate the buffering. Even at home, when you're watching a movie or something, you're buffering how, hated, how painful it can be. So many of those things, technology dependent. Many of these technologies, that experience, reality, mature or didn't exist. All in the works. To get there, we need some pillar technologies. The fundamental technologies have to get mature, have to become part and parcel of the platforms we're going to build on, because we're not going to design, uh, when I say we mean industry, not Harman or Samsung, we're not going to design a car for a country or a state or a city. We're not going to design standards for 5G telecommunication or ADAS for a country or for a car company. These have to be based on standards. L look back 15, 20 years ago, what started in telecom, that's how it started, Wild West. Everybody tried to do how many telecom companies started, and now basically two or three or four companies left because scale mattered, standardization took over, and today we have a well-functioning telecom sector. So based on that, let me just talk to you pillar technologies which are fundamental for the success of where we are headed. The first one to is very familiar to many of us, yet very challenging to do in a mobile environment when it comes to the car. That's the over-the-air update technology. Telecom has been using it. We update the firmware, software applications on our in packets almost every week, sometimes it's nuisance, there's too many change, too many updates it has. Imagine if you have to do live updates of firmware, software applications, and cybersecurity threats mitigation in the car when it's running 100 miles an hour. We're talking life and death. When you have a device in your hand, something goes wrong, it's a headache. But something goes wrong, going, wrong, gone wrong in a car, it's a life and death. So having a Robust OTA technology is the key. Well, we're very proud that we had access to a great company right here in Israel called uh, Redband, 15 years of defense development so that defense munitions could be updated with software applications, what have you. We are able to apply that across the industry worldwide. 
and it has gone viral. 23 car companies have already adopted that. 30 million cars on the road are getting updated, including company in California, all electric car, using the same technology. And I believe three, 400 million cars by 2021 would be using this technology. So one of the pillar technologies is OTA. Why? Because through OTA, not only you bring in updates to your car, but you will bring updates to your cybersecurity mitigation layers. Because cybersecurity is only as good as it keeps up with the bad guys. So you need to constantly be updating that in the client, in the cloud, in the edge. All of those three things will function at the same time. Second technology, in my view, equally important, probably the most important is cybersecurity. And who knows cybersecurity better than the United States and Israel and few other countries? Actually, I make a bold statement. You cannot have connected car without cybersecurity, period. And if you try to solve cybersecurity at the chipset level, good, I appreciate that. But that's not where the war would be won or lost. Cyber attacks are coming from all over the place. They're going into various engineering units. They're, they're finding ways, gateways to enter in the car. So you need various shields to do it. First of all, you need to do the intrusion detection. Then you need to kill it and understand the source of it. Then you need to utilize the data in the cloud to really create a community level in understanding where all these cyber attacks are coming from. And how do I deploy the solution I just learned for certain intrusion? How do I deploy cross car line? Whether they are supplied by company A, B, or C, I'm talking for industry. That's where the collaboration of government, collaboration of companies, technology, and users, the OEMs, have to happen. Because this is where we cannot draw a line and say, this is my cybersecurity solution, you find your own. It doesn't work like that. Same thing applies to when you're going to train the computer for the best of human knowledge, how to drive car in a thousand different ways in the same condition for autonomous simulation. You have to share that knowledge across cities, across com car companies, and what have you. So collaboration is the key. So cybersecurity will play an immensely important role. And I actually talk to many, many of our customers. We have customers all over the world. And I tell them humorously, I say, I hope you're fooling with me because you never talk about cybersecurity. Ask your automotive companies, how many of them are saying cybersecurity is one of my biggest worries? It has not become so far. But that tells you we are on inning one or two. Because if we were in inning seven or seventh or eighth inning in baseball, you would have very mature cybersecurity implementation. We're not there yet. Almost every car on the road can be hacked today. Almost every car. And I'm talking because I have 50 million cars on the road with my own system on. And we are the largest. So I'm telling you, we have vulnerability almost everywhere right now. But it's an opportunity. Cybersecurity is an area where we invested heavily again in Israel and acquired some technologies. And we have a fund we're investing in almost a dozen companies right now in Israel. They are startups, great startups with amazing uh, future if we can scale them, if we can productize them, if we can think globally. And that's why I make a point, not only going to Palo Alto, but this is the Palo Alto on a steroid when it comes to automotive, the Israel. I hope my colleagues appreciate those who are developing these things every day. But third one is telematics. Telematics is not new technology to any of you, any of us, been around for a long time. But telematics will play a bigger role because until 2015, telematics functioning at very small, a very slow rate because broadband technology, whatever you call it, 4G and LTE, actually functioned at the level two, 2G. I mean, whether, whichever country you are, I, I live in New York area, it always says 4G, but the performance is actually 3G. So we cannot operate the new telematics technology which we need up to 14, 15, 16 antennas in the car to do the autonomous experience. You need the 5, 10 gigabits per second. You need 5G, fully functioning 5G. The good news is 5G just been launched in telecom. And in the car, we will see 5G coming in 2021. And we, we are very excited because we have one of the car, we have actually more than one uh, company. We are already in works to implement 5G technology. This is another one. Without 5G, you can't even do ADAS, let alone autonomous driving. So 5G or very fast-paced telematics is fundamental technology. 
No discussion about that. Next is digital cockpit. Digital cockpit, I just wanted to show a picture because this is all about you and I. It's a user experience. Uh, we get pretty frightening. It gets pretty frightening to think so many technologies will come in car. How would we interact with it? At least until we have a steering wheel to work with. Is it going to be so emotionless robotic that it'll lose me? No. It's all about user interface. Uh, design, intuitive, contextual, personalized, using AI, working through multiple technologies, the retina base, the cognitive reading, understanding who you are, as soon as you enter the car, knows who you are, and it started to personalize. That's where we are headed. Rest of the stuff is technology five, whether it's a head up display, whether it's a beautiful OLED screens or QLED screens, seamless. There could be multiple SOCs behind, but we're talking about the seamless flow of information. We are very privileged and proud, and I'm not doing marketing pitch, but it is fantastic that Daimler, they gave Harman the best award for inno outstanding innovation for digital cockpit. Basically, they call it MBUX, Mercedes-Benz user interface. That's only a, a start of what's coming. A lot more will happen in digital cockpit, because that's where we need to capture what we would like to see, how we want to operate in the car, and how do we utilize. When I say how we want to operate in the car, remember I showed you a picture. I picture me five years from now, 10 years from now in the car, where I'm not driving, but I'm not sitting either. I'm not doing podcast, I'm doing video conferencing. I'm doing e-banking. I'm watching live games coming from cricket stadium or soccer stadium. I'm listening live concert from Kennedy Kennedy Center. I'm doing e-sports, e-gaming. Your living room, your office, your work environment, pretty much everything except so it's not a soccer field, you can't play in there. But you could do pretty much everything in the car. That's where digital cockpit 360, almost like an IMX experience, is what I'm imagining, which is what's going to happen in the next coming years here. So that brings me to the next topic. The only word that defines the slide is open. I'm a process control engineer, 22 years, worked for process control real time company called ABB, and I came here, I thought, that's a batch operation, must be easier. Actually, it's easier in many ways, very complex in so many other ways. But what has to happen, we cannot live with closed system architecture. As I said, no one company can do it all, so that means if we have closed architecture, others cannot participate. It has to be inclusive. It has to be able to allow multiple technology developers, solution providers to participate, to keep it alive and active, and sustainable. That's why it has to be open. We have our own initiative, very early stages. There's a, a company right, behind, right after me coming. They are the world leader. I call them king of the hill. But they need to open the system. We need to have an open system architecture. Driveline is our initiative to bring in sensors, algorithms, simulation, uh, supercomputing, all but open architecture. As I said, a lot of work has to happen in this area as industry. This slide is not an eye test. It's all about collaboration. I mentioned in passing that many, many companies in Israel, they are our portfolio companies we are investing, either active investor or we have outright purchased these companies to scale them faster. <coughs> Excuse me. This is going to go exponentially big. We're doing the same thing with the universities. We're doing this within China, in the United States, India, Germany, what have you, Japan. So collaboration is the name of the game, and that picture is nothing but collaboration. If we don't collaborate, we will not be fast enough. And if we're not fast enough, Gunter would not accept our solution, or other CEOs of the automotive companies will not accept, because they need now. That's the whole idea. So in closing, autonomous doesn't need to be monotonous. That's the idea. We need to have fun in the car. That's what we are here for. And in closing, in summary, the ultimate road trip has just begun. We, we want autonomous car, but we want fun. The user experience is the key that will define how we live our life. Technology has to be harmoniously applied without creating uh, this monotonous environment. We need to accelerate, have the open architecture, partnerships, collaboration, inclusive. Thank you all. And as I say, future is in front of us. Take care.